So my wife comes home on Saturday night, very late Saturday night, and she is ticked off. And for once, it's not about me, which makes me happy. But she is ticked off because she dropped like $250 playing video poker. Now understand this. My wife, who's a video poker addict, an absolute addict, should go to Gamblers Anonymous meetings, I swear to God, video poker addict, She's won like $8,000 playing video poker over the past three to four months. I don't know anybody who wins $8,000 playing video poker. And she's ticked off because she's lost like $250 last night. I'm going, you didn't have the Colorado Rockies last night. And I'm telling you guys, I am the first one who always says to you that the breaks ultimately even themselves out over the long run. That I know for an absolute fact. You can take it to the bank. I know it in 25 years as a handicapper. I know it in 28 to 29 years as a gambler. But no one says that you have to be happy when the breaks aren't going your way. But again, you know, as I always say, I don't celebrate the wins, nor do I lament the losses, because you just can't lose your focus in this business. But, but... Friday night, uh, the difference between a small winning night and a small losing night, the Houston Astros going into the bottom of the ninth inning with a 5-2 lead at Milwaukee. Their all-star closer, Lindstrom, comes in. Boom! Brewers score four runs. They win 6-5. Last night, 1-1 one one on the early card, a five-dime small play out there. The difference between a small winning day and a small losing day. The Colorado Rockies, they come back, they score three runs in the top of the ninth inning to force uh, extra innings. Todd Helton smacks a two-run homer in the top of the tenth. And then the Rockies' bullpen serves up a three-run homer to the Pirates' rookie third baseman. Game, set, match. Pirates walk off with the win. And my wife's pissed off because she lost a little money playing video poker. But guys, I'm going to tell you something. You know, and I've mentioned that these past three weeks haven't exactly been the finest three weeks of my life. And matter of fact, the longest losing streak I've ever gone through, period. But I, first of all, never lose confidence that I will win and that ultimately that I will always turn a profit over the long course of the season, over the long course of the year, because generally I always do. And that's just confidence. And guys, if you second guess yourself and you don't have confidence, A, you shouldn't be gambling, and B, you certainly should not be a professional handicapper. You have no right otherwise to be in this business. Um, but I know I am that close. I, I look at the games that I had yesterday. I had a Five picks, five picks that I wrote down yesterday, the games that I had to choose from. Um, I used the Rockies, and of course I lost them. I had the Yankees on the run line. I won that. I had the Rangers. I lost that. Then I had two more plays, two plays that I considered using as a paid play, but ultimately I had to choose one of them and use them as a free play. And those two plays were the White Sox on the run line or Tampa Bay. Well, Tampa, you know, I didn't use. They lost by 117 runs at Toronto. I gave you the White Sox here as a run line play. What happened? Palho scored one run in the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth inning to win 4-2 at Baltimore. So I know I am right there. So when I say sometimes I'm not feeling it, understand that means I'm dialing down the ratings because I'm dialing down the amount that I'm personally wagering because every day I think I'm going to win. But when I'm not exactly feeling it, again, it's like when you set up or step up to the craps table and you're the shooter, you know, you got to feel supremely confident. When you're not 100% confident, that's when I dial down the ratings because, A, I've got to protect my bankroll and I've got to protect your bankroll, and B, I've got to make sure that I get back on the winning track. And personally, I think I'm right there. Just... Again, break simply went against me. Um, let's talk about preseason football here for a moment. Uh, a couple of things you always have to factor in about preseason football. First of all, you've got to consider the coaches involved. Some coaches, veteran coaches with veteran teams, they just don't give a damn about preseason football, the wins and losses. Think Bill Belichick. Think Andy Reid, okay? Now, new coaches, especially those that come on board with bad teams. They want a clean house. They want to come out fast and furious. They want to make a statement. They want to turn that losing attitude into a winning attitude. Preseason holds a lot more for them. Consequently, the hair's driving me crazy. Consequently, winning is put at more of a premium for them in the preseason. But also keep in mind that the odds makers factor that in as well. Other things that you have to consider, of course, in the first two weeks of the preseason, you're not betting the teams that you are accustomed to seeing. The starters are only going to play maybe a series or two. Sometimes if that first series is an extended drive, that might be it. They might only be in for 10 or 11 plays total in the game. No, what you've got to be aware of, if you're not using and seeking professional advice, 
things that you have to be aware of, the quarterback rotations, who's going to follow up Peyton Manning, who's going to follow up Tom Brady, etc., and how much are those second stringers, and more importantly, the third and perhaps fourth stringers going to play. And then I think the most uh, next most important position is the running back position. Forget about the wide receiver position. Guys can get out there and catch the ball. You've got to be concerned with who's going to carry the ball for you those second and third string running backs. The other things then you have to consider, and this is the toughest part, the status of the offensive line, especially those second and third stringers that are going to see the bulk of the action the first two weeks of preseason play, and then number four, the defensive line. Is the defensive line, A, going to be able to get any pressure on those second and third string quarterbacks, and B, are they going to be able to stop the ground game? So, so many things to consider in preseason football. That's why a lot of guys take passes on preseason football until you get to week number three, when at least you've got the starters playing generally the first half, if not three quarters of the contest. And then, of course, week number four, everybody goes into hibernation once again. Uh, personally, I've always found that uh, the internet is the greatest learning tool because how I prepare for the preseason and for regular season for pro football and college football alike is beat writers. The beat writers are my eyes and my ears. They're in every practice. They're in the locker room. I read on the internet every single team's beat writers report every single day. That's how I know what's going on. So you've got Dallas and Cincinnati tonight in the Canton, Ohio Hall of Fame game. Right now the line is Cincinnati is two and a half. I've got to be honest with you guys. If I was on a roll right now and I had bank roll to spare, I might use Cincinnati tonight, but my lowest rated play is a five-dime release. In reality, I think Cincinnati would be like a one to two dime play. I want to put that in perspective for you. And remember, every bet is a 50-50 proposition, but this is truly a crapshoot tonight, this Hall of Fame game, okay? It's just the worst possible game out there. Now, interestingly enough, the last two times the Bengals have appeared in a Hall of Fame game, they've won the division title, and of course in 1988 they also went to the Super Bowl. Dallas 0-3 lifetime straight up in Hall of Fame games. The biggest factor here tonight that you have to consider is this. You know, Cincinnati, it's pretty much a home game, uh, even though Dallas had their uh, Emmett Smith uh, inducted yesterday. Keep in mind, you know, Canton, Ohio is where the game is, Cincinnati, Ohio, okay? The other thing you have to consider is this. Dallas plays again four nights from now, Thursday night, in Jerry Jones's palace at home against the Oakland Raiders and another nationally televised game. So where Cincinnati doesn't play again until next Sunday, Dallas plays again, as I said, on Thursday evening. In terms of who your money is going to be on tonight, you know, Carson Palmer and T.O. and those guys are going to be in there for maybe the first two series. Marvin Lewis, I believe, is 14 and 14 straight up in preseason action. But once Carson Palmer and those guys sit on the bench, you know, J.T. O'Sullivan, who has seen a lot of career action as a backup, is going to be playing. And then he's going to be followed by Jordan Palmer. Now, neither one of them per performed very well in Friday's uh, practices, but keep in mind, that they haven't been practicing with the first teamers. That's probably why they were out of sync. I think that's a very common thing. As for Dallas, you know, once Tony Romo takes a seat on the bench, you're going to probably see John Kitna in there. Now, Kitna did not throw a regular season pass last year. And then Stephen McGee, who I kind of like. He had that uh, very up and down, good finish at his career, though, at Texas A&M. So again, I think if you play the game, you play Cincinnati. Keep in mind, Dallas has some injuries. Not only Des Bryant, but Marcus Spears, uh, Martellus Bennett, and others are also going to be out. Um, but the line's two and a half. It's going to go to three already in some places I see it. It's going to probably go to three and a half. You know, if it's three and a half or three, even though this is a preseason game, you've got to buy down the half point. Okay? That's what you would do. As for your baseball free pick, I like the Dodgers on the run line. Even though they struggle scoring runs, I think you have to play them that way with Ted Lilly on the hill. Strong debut against the Padres. Seven innings of two hit, one run ball. Although he hasn't won consecutive games so far this season. However, a 2.48 earned run average against the Nationals franchise since they moved to Washington from Montreal after the 2005 season. Washington going with Jason Marquis tonight. He is uh, making his first start since April 18th. He's been sidelined all this time with bone chips in his elbow. So I would lay the run and a half with the Dodgers, who of course last night won 3-2 in extra innings. Good luck everybody and I'll catch you again on Monday.